Hi, good morning and welcome to the ZP um, webinar. So we're doing this webinar on Sensi All. So Sensi All is one of our kind of platforms from Zimmer and Peacock. And um, it's really about a way of, I would say, scaling um, and rapidly commercializing electrochemical assays. So let me dive straight into it. We'll have people, um, typically people sort of drift in as we go along. So today's the 26th of March. We do one of these, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and we will be repeating it um, every month. The thing that we will be focusing on today is um, the electrochemical OEM um, platform, which is um, the image that I'm showing here. Um, though at ZP, we also have a wearables platform as well, but I think we'll mostly focus on kind of point of care um, IVD in vitro diagnostics um, applications um, today. I might just do a quick um, change of um, headphones. So hopefully you can, not headphones, sorry, um, a quick change of um, microphone. But um, uh, so I anyway, know I'll just go ahead now and um, carry on and say we're going to focus mostly on um, OEM and we will be not so talking about wearables today. Though at ZP, we do have a big wearables platform that allows um, in a watch format um, people to have these wrist watches. It has micro needles. Micro needles um, do break the skin, and that's important because, in fact, the FDA have just, I wouldn't call it a ruling, but the FDA have just made an, um, an advisory that they're warning people not to necessarily trust non-invasive um, glucose monitoring. So there's a lot of technology out there called CGM, continuous glucose monitoring, and the FDA are warning people not to use CGMs that don't necessarily break the skin. They're trying to sort of stop people from going on Amazon and finding these non-invasive glucose watches and believing that they actually you know, work as, as advertised. But ZP, we do have a whole stack of technologies um, actually for wearables, um, but today we won't be so focused, let's say, on the wearables part. Um, there could be a big question as to the why of the of this of this entire um, webinar, and the, and the why really is because um, at ZP we have a kind of an idea that most people, in, especially in simple applications, well, simple is a you know is a relative term, but we think that a lot of people should really be getting to the market in something like um, two years rather than the sort of normal five, fifteen, or five, ten, fifteen years that it actually takes. So we have a sort of a much faster um, get to market attitude um, than is typical. So we basically have a technology stack that's quite um, agnostic. So if I was trying to support, for example, manufacturing in the um, in the biopharmaceutical space, I would kind of argue that there they don't really want scientific instruments. They actually want um, point of care or point of need, I should say, uh, sort of instruments. Um, so we, we're we trying to make all of our hardware um, quite, uh, I, I want to say, simple to use. So we have a kind of platform here, which is um, this is a handheld size device. I realize I've got one in the room, but it's just up on the shelf, so I won't grab it this minute. But we do have this um, point of care device, um, point of need device called Sense It All. We have very reproducible screen printed electrodes. In fact, I do recognize one of the delegates knows our screen printed electrodes extremely well and knows the reproducibility of these screen printed electrodes. And we also have an app. This app you are able to download today. So if you've got a smartphone, like an, if you're watching this on a screen and you've got your phone next to you, you will be able to do this. By the way, you don't need to take notes because I will send out video, um, a recording to everyone who's attended today. So we have our um, electronics, we have our sensors, we have our app, and the app is available today on the Apple uh, App Store and also on the Google Play Store. Um, it already connects to our cloud system called Julie. This is really important. Um, if you're trying to develop a electrochemical product, having the cloud built in is really advantageous. So at ZP, we make um, a version of the technology that I'm showing on, the, on here today. We make a version of it available to the food ingredients market. So we are, for example, supporting um, real-time manufacturing um, in India. And it's so advantageous to us that actually um, if somebody makes a test on our system, the data and you'll see um, Guyana today um, and Ricardo actually send the data in real time to the cloud. It's really important because if you are supporting manufacturing, especially if you're talking about alpha and beta testers and it's the same for clinical as well. Um, 
that especially when you're dealing with your alpha and beta testers, you really want to make sure that you've got all your data. So the fact that the electronics works with our screen printer electrodes and our biosensors, the fact that the app that distributes this hardware is available already on the Google Play Store and the Apple App Store. The fact that it talks to the cloud is really advantageous because, you know, there's nothing worse than having that email come through that says, oh, it's not working and you've got nowhere to go with that. But actually the raw data is all sent to the cloud and you'll see that today. And the nice thing about this as well is that we're already built into um, the API, the application um, application program interface um, economies. Uh, there's a sort of global economy where um, different cloud services talk to each other through API and we can plug into that kind of um, global economy. Uh, I think it really opens up businesses of the future where, in fact, businesses of the future will be more kind of application led rather than technology led. So they'll be sort of um, because you can sense glucose here, can you sense glucose here? And therefore, I can turn that technology stack into my um, a part of my product offering. So in the future, um, you know, people won't necessarily be doing all the deep tech development innovation in house. They'll be more interested in actually getting to market. And I should go a little bit quicker and just say we have this technology stack and it's and I have the word here agnostic because we don't really mind what the assay is that you want or what the analyzer is. I understand, you know, that there is a certain um, limitation on what analytes electrochemistry can address, but it's quite broadly applicable from small molecules to proteins to ions. There's another bit that um, that people need to develop is the assay itself. Will it be voltammetry, square wave voltammetry, differential pulse voltammetry? Um, and then there's actually the calibration routine, how to turn that raw signal into something that's meaningful, like uh, mix per DL or millimoles um, or PPM parts per million, you know, different users will expect the units in or expect units that are kind of standard in their industry. And then there's also the kind of bit where people can really add value, which is how to serve this information up in a way that is um, easy to consume by the actual end user. So at ZP, we have this technology stack, but we see people in the future being more like app developers than necessarily being the entire technology stack developer. Um, I can have a whole conversation about in, uh, outsources versus insourcing, but the model today is that most companies are primarily funded to do insourcing. But it's because I think the technologies that would allow them to otherwise just outsource most of it actually didn't exist before there were companies like ZP. Anyway, that said, I'll go a little bit faster. One of the things that we're very keen on at ZP is actually this kind of um, sense that, you know, a lot of people, when they start their businesses or start their commercialization of, of academic, they kind of focus on the technology, they focus on the manufacturing and the business aspect can sometimes be the sort of third thing that's thought about. So everyone is basically trying to come up with technology readiness levels. So there's the sort of basic principles all the way through to system deployed. And this is what governments and VCs kind of try and fund people to actually um, come up. And this is the traditional route, you know, you start off, well, possibly if it's a spin out from a, you know, from a university, you may start off at proof of principle or validation in the lab, TRL three and four. And I know one of the um, attendees today is actually giving a lecture on this in a few weeks time, I believe. So um, I understood, I understand that, you know, TRLs are understood by you. The thing about the TRL path is it can lead to a five year to maybe even a 10 to 15 year journey because you have to do all of this in in house, you've basically insourced it. At the end of which, your probability of success, or rather your rate of failure, is something like ninety percent. So your probability of success is ten percent. And it's a bit of a shame that people invest so much of their lives into this with a sort of one in ten chance of actually being successful. Um, so at ZP, we actually want to flip this around and allow people to actually focus on. The thing that really makes a business, which is the business itself of the sales and marketing and winning customers and winning market share. So when you look at this technology stack from ZP, you actually realize that a lot of the manufacturing and technology is already done. Um, now, that means that if we can cut away lots of the TRL efforts, so basic principles, technology, system prototype, really important. I mean, we're showing you hardware today and we'll do a demo of hardware today, you know, that works um system complete and qualified system deployed we've already deployed this for example you can download it on these and get, getting an app onto the apple store you have to be fairly robust to get onto the apple store it's not straightforward 
I don't want to say most people can get something on the Google Play Store, but their their quality level is threshold is lower on Google than it is at Apple. So our manifesto is the technology stack from Zero Pico can get people down to two years uh, because, in fact, we just leave them with a, a subset of things that they have to have otherwise um, done. A really important part of what we're talking about today as well is actually the ability to um, if you build and win customers order fulfillment. Um, and I've saw a, a comment on LinkedIn today about the, um, the conservation of capital. So what they mean by the conservation of capital is how you hold on to your money as long as possible. So if you want to order fulfillment, if you want to do an order at the moment, somebody will order something from you. You'll probably have to either do it yourself, but you're trying to run the entire business or you'll then use parts of your team or you may have dedicated logistics people in your business. Um, and that's all burning your capital. But with ZP, if you're on our platform, on our Sensi All platform, you can put an order in. Um, you rather you receive an order from your client. That means that you can uh, issue an order to ZP. ZP will follow the instructions. We'll put the sensors and the platform in a box together, package that, and we'll ship that um, around the world. And we've been doing this now for one of our clients who is C marked. Um, well over five years we've been actually doing this so it's a kind of amazon you know people are interested uh, you know understand the term drop shipping um, or direct shipping to clients so that's something that we can do so suddenly the idea that you'd have to build up a um, logistics arm an operational arm you may have just reduced the headcount from three or five people down to zero because instead instead it just becomes an instruction to zp and then you don't have to carry all those costs um on your business all of the time Five people who are not 100 percent. Well, you know, five people is a, is a lot of um, is a lot of salary to cover if you're not utilizing it. Why are we doing this? Well, as EP, we understand that you have a um, any product has a product life cycle. So at ZP, we have a product uh, called FoodSense. At the moment, we're primarily selling it into technology enthusiasts and visionaries. So if you go on YouTube, you'll see that. Um, there's a gentleman using our technology called Ed Curry. Um, he is the grower of the world's hottest chili. But, you know, you can just tell from his personality that he's a technologist and he's a visionary. Um, somebody who tries to win Guinness records, you know, for hottest chili is not is not he's not the 90 percent of the population. He's out, you know, on, on the edge because he's a driver of technology. Um, now, a lot of people in, in industry and business, you know, are pragmatists. Um, some people are actually conservatives and then they, and then you've got the skeptics. So if you're you have a new product and you're about to launch it to the market, um, you know, the bulk of your market is your pragmatists and your conservatives. The people that you possibly will never sell to are the skeptics. Um, you know, that skeptics could be a 20 year journey. But in the early days, um, you're actually selling to the technology enthusiasts and the visionaries. And there's actually a gap then between um, the visionaries and the pragmatists. The pragmatists are people who say, oh, well, that looks interesting. And I can think of the pharmaceutical industry, for example, being a, an industry full of pragmatists. Um, the clinical industry is an industry, you know, you have you do have visionaries, enthusiasts, but some people say, you know what, you know, I need clinical studies, I need this, I need C marking, I need AOAC validation. They need all these reasons. I need references from customers. These are your pragmatists. And so you have to recognize what they are and who they are, and you have to obviously respect it, but you also have to have an idea that actually you need to focus on the technology enthusiasts and the visionaries, and you have to build towards the pragmatists. Now, the reason I say all this is because people are so busy in their startups actually doing the um, technology and the manufacturing, they're not having an eye on this. And really, I want, you know, we want your intellectual, let's say, brain power actually on considering this gap between visionaries and pragmatists and how you're going to span that gap. Um, this is actually what I'm citing here is a, or using here is actually a book by a guy called Jeffrey Moore, which is called Crossing the Chasm. So you will find other references to this. But the big thing at ZP is we find too many people spending too much time doing things that are relatively easy to them because they like technology and maybe, you know, manufacturing that technology is interesting. But the real hard questions in life is how you're going to sell a market and and how are you going to um, bridge this gap between visionaries and pragmatists. So at ZP, that's why we've developed our technology stack. So you can go from zero to something very quickly, start 
um, engaging with the enthusiasts and the visionaries really quickly and start, I say, noodling on how you're going to get across this chasm to the pragmatists. Um, the Sense It All solution. So um, if you've got your smartphone, um, you can scan this off an Android. It will take you to an app on the um, on the Google Play Store, and that will install an app called Sense It All. Now, I am recording this, so everyone who's here today, you can see that we're live recording, and I'll send you a recording afterwards. Um, similarly, if you're an iPhone user, you can um, scan this QR code, and this will take you to the Apple App Store, and you will have the uh, iOS version of that app. Now, the reason I bring this up is because Sense It All is a multi uh, analyte platform. So I don't know what your target target is, but if it's C-reactive protein, then it can be um, functionalized towards C-reactive protein. If your um, target is generic proteins, then we can you know, functionalize the electrodes to be specific or not specific, to be more generally um, um, sensitive to proteins. If your mo molecule is small molecule, then we can either put an enzyme in there. If it's large molecule, obviously antibodies or aptamers or antigens, um, no, sorry, aptamers or antibodies are more um, suitable, ions, ionophores, for example. So, you know, these QR codes, every time you scan a QR code, the entire app will change its look and feel. And I'll get this into this a little bit deeper. But so, for example, we have a QR code for chili. We have a QR code for ginger. We have a QR code for nitrate. We have a QR code for total antioxidative capacity. Um, we have a QR code for glucose. Uh, we have a QR code for potassium. We have a QR app. Ah, we also have then the idea of generic QR codes, QR codes that do nothing, but actually these are editable because this is a platform for other people to make technologies upon. So you've got a customer, you don't need to send them software, they can just use the QR code. Once they've opened that QR code, um, they can scan QR codes like this and it will make this, the system specific to a particular analyte, or actually you can have a generic QR code, or I call it here your assay, where in fact that is something that essentially it will rebrand the um, app to be specific to your particular um, assay, your branding, your company, um, those aspects. So for example, this is what, if you scanned the last your assay QR code here, you can do this afterwards. Um, it'll bring up something that just says sense it all, and it's fairly generic. There's no sensor name, there's no sensor, there's no batch, there's, you know, I test ID, everything's kind of quite um, generic here. Um, and so these are kind of all editable fields and colors so that you can actually end up rebranding this very quickly to your particular um, assay, your business. So what this means is that realistically, if you said, oh, well, I need to go and show I need to go and show somebody hardware and have it branded, at least in the software for me. And I need to do a, you know, a investor pitch. You know, I want to do this in four weeks time. This platform would allow you to do that. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the biggest delay is our shipping time. Um, it's not actually the engineering work. So suddenly you can go from zero to something that's not just a potential stat with a slot and it's all very clunky to something that's actually much more product like really fast. So you can see what this is going to do to, you know, because most uh, investors or government agencies would kind of say, oh, well, you know, you need you need some, you know, a prototype. Bang, there's your prototype done. Of course, if you get them to pay for you for, to get that prototype together, even um, better. Big part of this is that ZP is that we do have a lot of screen printed electrodes. These are the world's, you know, in my in, a, in our slightly humble opinion, I think these are one of the world's most reproducible screen printed electrodes around. Why? Because we use them all the time. We really focus on repeatability and we re, and we make sure that we test every batch uh, before it goes out. So it's kind of repeatability comes in part from manufacturing and also from um, testing, obviously, um, OQC, outgoing quality control, which is not something I've really mentioned, but ZP is ISO 13485, so we do believe very strongly in quality. Quality is not for free, quality does take a cost. Um, but that said, the reason that we have this Sensi All platform is it works with our screen printed electrodes, and that may, makes it much easier um, to actually convert electrochemical assays into um, products. I mean, at ZP, we do have a whole range of biosensors. People can adopt these biosensors for various applications. 
I mean, the list, you know, is of recent is creatinine, histamine, um, lactose is up here, urea is up here. This is almost in um, chronological order. You know, the first thing we did was glucose, oxygen, obviously, um, not obviously, but some of you know we have a long history of lactate. Um, hydrogen peroxide is something that we have a client on the market with. pH um, is the it's either the first or second most measured um, analyte in the world, but we definitely have pH and we have a pH calibration free version as well. And anyway, so we have a lot of electrochemical sensors that can be translated into new applications. This is the hardware itself, the sensor all hardware. As I say, I do have one on my shelf, but um, Guyana and Ricardo can show you this hardware um, shortly. It's really elegant um, in terms of the way the sensors click in, the way we can actually dismantle it to clean it. Um, the guys run it off their laptop, but they only run the, they're only using the laptop as a power source. Um, it doesn't it does not need a PC to run. Um, it just needs a USB um, power source, um, as you can see here, and then it's good to go. It can I bring this up because many of you will have electrochemical or some of you will have electrochemical backgrounds. So if the assay is amperometry or potentiometry or voltammetry or impedance spectroscopy, we can apply those assays to this platform. Um, I want to say no sweat. Um, um, also, um, the sensor all in, comes in. It comes kind of comes in its box. So we've you know we've thought through um, you know the we have the kit itself. It has a manual. The manual is very you know to be frank, it's very elegant. Um, it's very thin, and the manual really represents actually the ease of this um, piece of hardware. You know, this system only has one button on it, which is on and off. And we only put the on and off on there because people like to turn things on and off. So, you know, you have to give them that kind of tactile feedback that they have um, actually turned it um, on. Um, just click a bit. Um, we also um, put into there um, the buffers. Um, if the assay act that is requires a buffer, not all assays actually require uh, an assay, but and then we also do the sort of sensors in this kind of very elegant kind of cartridge so so that uh, it's not just a screen printed electrode and something we say a lot is no slots there's nothing horrible than trying to slot something in so um they get something that's very tangible in terms of people can handle these quite easily they can break them out from there so if you're kind of you know supporting a clinical application or a manufacturing application it's very easy you click one out put the sensor on onto the instrument and you're essentially um good to go the way the hardware works is we have sensors, we have the hardware, we have the app. So the app is available today on the um, Play Store or the um, Apple Store. We have a cloud system. You will see this in operation. This cloud has been in development on for over 10 years now, and this is actually its second iteration. Um, but the sensor works with a meter. The sample goes onto the sensor. The app tells the meter what to do. So, you know, it says, you know, it actually says, look, this is amperometry or this is um, cycle voltammetry or this is um, differential pulse voltammetry. The app tells the meter what to do. The meter gives the data back to the app. The app sends it to the cloud. And actually, there's a conversion of raw signal into information. And you'll see this happen in real time today. This is the really important part as well, that actually it's cloud enabled. So the operator, the time and date, any notes, um, and the raw signal all goes to the cloud. Now, we do understand that for medical applications, you can't be putting um, client names, birth dates, et cetera, into that. But it doesn't matter to be honest. You're in a clinical trial, you can just put test ID, and then the clinician can have a lookup table that they keep locked away, where test ID may relate to a certain patient, but we do not need to know that, and you do not need to know that either. And what's nice about this as well is then, if you want to support clients in the field, um, you don't need them to send you data. They just need to give you access. So it's a clickable access thing and we can see data. So if we had a client in Australia, for example, and they were using um, they were measuring the capsaicin in chilies um, and they were having problems, then it's easy for them to actually just share the data with us and we can give them um, real time support. This is very important to you because essentially, you know, we talk about technology and um, we are talking about technology be here, but a part of your value is actually your intellect. And so if you can bring your intellect onto your customer's data, it can um, help them and help you as well. And if you find problems, then you can also implement fixes because actually you can fi implement the fixes in the cloud, which is what we've been, we did for a particular client. A client had a very oily sample 
oils love to stick to surfaces. Electrochemistry is the surface technology. So we did have an, um, I wouldn't say an issue, but we did have an inter interesting interference and we did actually fix it. So I've got here some demos. So what I think what we're demoing today is actually um, chili, ginger and potassium. So I think we're going to go in approximately that order. So what I'll do is I'll stop sharing. I'll turn off my microphone. I'll turn off my camera. Um, Guyana will come in on her side um, and um, then we'll do the demos and then I'll do a quick summary at the end. So thanks, Guyana. Thank you, Martin. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Guyana. I'm here with uh, Ricardo today and we'll start with a uh, sensitive demonstration. Uh, we have uh, chili, potassium and ginger sensors with us and we can go one by one and see how the sensitive works. Um, I'll show you what I have. I have a device and here are the sensors and I also already prepared the solutions for testing. Uh, so the first thing that I will do, I will turn on the device. I need to press uh, this button for two seconds. And now I see that uh, there is a blue gliding uh, light, which means the device is ready to be connected through uh, Bluetooth. And I'll show you the app. And now I will try to connect the device to the app. I'll press to connect the device uh, button. And now it scanned the available devices and found CR 2027. Uh, and I checked uh, that the label is 2027 20, for this particular sensitive device. So I can click on it and try to connect. Yeah, now I see the device is connected and I see the serial number of the device. The next thing uh, that I need to do, I will need to scan the QR code for this particular assay. Right now, it's a uh, ginger sensor is scanned, but I will scan the chili one to show you how it works. Uh, so this one is the chili uh, QR code. I'll just place it on top. And now the mobile app that I recognize the QR code and it's set up for chili sensor measurement. I also see the sensor part number and um, I say uh, how many steps I need to do to perform this assay. Uh, the next thing I will do, I will change the test settings. There is this uh, card on the bottom of the uh, screen. I'll click on it. Uh, now I can set up the sample ID. I'll change it to Chile. And the cluster name, I will name it Sia Demo. An operator ID is my name. Uh, so cluster name and sample ID are crucial to find the data in the jewelry in the end, in the end of the measurement. I'll show you how to find the data once we are done. I'll click uh, back button and I think we are ready so we can start. Uh, so I am pressing the go to assay uh, button and now I see the instructions. The first thing I need to do is to select dilution factor. I have uh, this uh, sample with me, which is Tabasco sauce mixed with a chili pot buffer with 1 to 10 ratio. So the dilution factor is 10 in this case. And it, it's already uh, selected 10, but I'll show you how to do that. I'll just click to the button and then click 10. Uh, now I need to place and lock the cartridge. So here's the sensor I'm placing inside the slot. and then move this part up. And now the sensor is connected to the device. And now I'm shaking the sample to mix it well. And now I'll pipe it, some sample on it. Usually 50 microliter is enough to cover all electrodes. I'm trying to cover all electrodes. And it's done. Now I can start the measurement. Uh, now we see that the whole process takes uh, 30 seconds. What it does, the, um, the device runs cyclic voltammetry and it sends the data to the mobile app. Mobile app po posts this data in Julie. 
uh, where the data gets analyzed and it's also stored there. And once the data is analyzed, it sends the results uh, back to the mobile screen and we will see it uh, quite soon. Yep, uh, we got uh, with micromolarity and milligram per liter and also with uh, scovid heat units, it says 2,181 scovid heat units. Uh, this is uh, correct because Tabasco usually is claiming between 2,000 to 5,000. Uh, and I also see uh, that um, LED light is green now. It means that, the, that it's posted in Julie and I can find the data there. Uh, I'll click done button from the mobile app. And I'll show you uh, Julie. Yeah, so this is my, uh, I will need to find SIA demo cluster. Yeah. And this is the serial number of my device, SIA 2027. I'm clicking on it. And here I see my latest um, latest report, uh, which is Chile, because I named it as Chile uh, from the beginning of the test. I'll click on it. Now we see the scans. We see two cyclic voltammograms, and we also see pre-processed data, and we see that we are analyzing peaks to, to detect the um, uh, to detect the values. Now I'll move forward, and I'll. I'll run uh, ginger uh, assay. I will need to scan the QR code. Yeah, it's done. Mm, I will also change sample ID from chili to ginger. Yeah, this is done too. And I'm going uh, to assay and I see the instructions. Again, it asks us to choose the dilution factor. Uh, today I have a, a solution which is which was prepared with uh, chili uh, ginger shot buffer mixed uh, mixed uh, with a ginger shot uh, solution uh, with one to ten ratio. Uh, so I will click ten. I place the cartridge. Click it to make the connect connection. and pipette some testing solution. Make sure that all electrodes are covered and once it's done, I'll start the measurement. This assay runs a uh, cyclic voltammogram too, so once the data uh, is gathered from the potential stat, it sends the results, it sends the whole data to Julie, where it gets analyzed and stored. And so results are back. I see that the flood was complete and we got results with uh, molarity and milligram per liter. I'll show you how to find the data in Julie. Uh, so because I didn't change the cluster name, I will find it in the same cluster. I just need to refresh it. And now I see there is a ginger test. I will click on that and I'll get the report. Yeah, and I see the pre-processed data and uh, we also analyze uh, some peaks here to detect the values. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Ricardo can run the potassium. I'll just change screen. Yeah. Yeah, so we are uh, ready to start with the potassium test. We'll remove the previous cartridge and we will uh, scan the new QR code for potassium. And here you are. We have the screen for potassium loaded. Then the next thing we'll uh, we'll want to do is again change the sample uh, the sample ID. In this case, put in here uh, potassium, and leave the other things unchanged. And then we can uh, put in the cartridge inside the device, plug it in, 
and go to assay. So once we go into the assay, we'll get the instructions on the screen. In this case, the instructions that we're getting is basically to mix uh, equal parts of a baseline solution and a sample. As you see here, I have two solutions, a baseline and a uh, spiking solution. So in this case, what I did is I mixed already the sample with uh, both solutions that we're providing. And so I'll just start and pipe at a mix of a one to one ratio of baseline and sample solution on uh, the sensor surface. And then we can click on start the measurement. So in this case, um, the test that we are uh, performing is uh, potentiometry. Once again, once the once we will have uh, performed the measurements on both uh, solutions, you'll find uh, results of the test in Julie uh, for you to later uh, check out the raw data and the pre-process uh, data. So we have done the first part of the measurement. We can now uh, remove the previous sample from the sensor surface. And we are ready to add the second solution, which is again a mix of one to one ratio of a spiking solution and our sample. And again, we click on start measurement and we get basically the second part of our test being performed. So what happens in this case is basically we are um, adding an equal ratio, a sample to a baseline and a spiking solution of known concentration. And we're taking basically the difference between the two concentrations of the solutions, which will tell us uh, the concentration of the unknown samples that we are um, testing with our potassium sensor. The test is uh, done. As you see, we got our uh, results on the screen of the app. And then if we want to dig into the actual data, we can do so in Julie. So right now, uh, again, you refresh, we are in the same cluster. So you'll find it in the same cluster. We can get into the potassium uh, test. And what you'll see is uh, once again, the raw data, and the pre-process data. As I was saying before, we are in this case running potentiometry. And what we're looking at is basically the difference between um, the sample and our calibration solution. And so you'll be able to find all that in uh, Julie right after the test. OK, well, uh, thanks. Um, sorry, Guyana. Yeah, go ahead, Guyana. Uh, no, I was just saying that's all with, that we prepared today. Yeah, I appreciate it, Guyana. Thank you. So. I think the main, the main ob, um, let's say, um, thing that we want to achieve today really is to sort of show you the robustness of that workflow. You know that, you know, those were three live demos, and you know, you know, the app doesn't crash, the hardware doesn't crash, the cloud doesn't crash. You know, the cloud is talking to the app. You know, so you can see, and and it's it's really a reflection of that fact we've been, you know. We're on a generation four of this sense it all platform. So, you know, it's all those iterations, you know, of, you know, lead to us to this very robust place. And so our simple, our simple sort of, um, I wouldn't call it an argument, but, you know, is, is essentially this, that if you want to very rapidly at least get to a very robust prototype, there's that platform. And in fact, really the value add in the future will be finding those customers, designing web interfaces to kind of log people's data and to give them a kind of you know a user experience so this actually you know will take care of a lot of the technology and leave people with dealing with the really hard parts of business which is actually finding those customers and retaining those customers so in summary you can see that we have a, um, a ro robust platform that didn't come overnight you know there's been a lot of many of many years work going into that it's multi-analyte you saw the way we just went between analytes just by using different qr codes and so we call it an OEM platform, an original equipment manufacturing platform, because 
we can take a lot of electrochemical assays and biosensors to at least prototype stage very rapidly through that particular um, platform. Um, and as we say, the technology stack is agnostic because depending on how you functionize the electrode will will give it its selectivity or its specificity, the way you drive the electrode, the electrochemical method that you end up using, and then that calibration routine, how you turn the um, raw data into information is also something that can be developed and kind of proprietary. So I think just to say that we have another webinar on the 23rd of April. I'm not expecting any of you to come to that, of course, but I just want, you know, if you've got colleagues that you think are interested, um, I will be sending out a um, a recording of this and this um, this URL. We update it all the time with the next um, webinars as well. So thank you for coming today. I can see it's 45 minutes and 30 and 40 odd seconds now. So I just want to say thank you. Here's a contact us, though. I, everyone in the room, I do recognize your name. So lovely to see you, especially our, our colleagues um, from Australia. OK, take care and speak to some of you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, Guyana, and thanks, Ricardo. It's appreciated.